Okay. Good evening, everybody. Maybe I can say to the people who are coming to come to the first row, you're always afraid to come in the light. Okay. So, good evening, uh, Oslo. <laughs> So, first of all, uh, I present myself. I'm uh, Evelyn Heutebroek. Uh, I'm Belgium from Brussels, and I'm a member of uh, the European Green uh, Party Committee, and uh, also, as I can say, in charge of uh, uh, local consular events with my colleague uh, Michel, who is there who is, will be also from the Czech Republic, who will also moderate tomorrow uh, our working group. And uh, first of all, I'm very happy to be here for this evening, because we have very nice speakers, you will, you will see. Uh, and also the first question is why EGP is organizing such, such event? We try to do it two times a year, uh, and for the past four years we organized with local, and we, when we say local it can be regional or local uh, councillors on different thematics. We did it on refugees, we did also on mobility in uh, different cities of, uh, of Europe. And we do it because we think it's a real opportunity for our elected people who sometimes, and I know it, I'm also, I was also a, a regional minister and now a local councillor in my municipality in Brussels. Uh, but uh, sometimes the, our elected people, they, they work, but sometimes isolated and they they want sometimes also to share their project, their initiatives, what they are doing with other green elected uh, people. And uh, so it was the idea to invite mayor, vice mayor, local councillor, greens from all over uh, Europe to present their achievements on different uh, thematics as mobility, urban planning, climate plant, uh, and, and it allows to build a real galaxy, I can say, a uh, green galaxy in Europe and even in, uh, in the world. Uh, I say in the world because I see also Kelly Yen, who is there for the global, uh, global greens. I think that you can also discuss with her with what's happening in the, in the world in other big cities, sometimes much bigger than us. And uh, also organizing that is an opportunity to communicate, to communicate uh, externally about our achievements to the media, to the social uh, network, uh, to the public opinion. Uh, and uh, it's also, we try to, to organize that, it's more important when we organize that in a city where there is a challenge, of course, because there will be elections. And we know that in Norway there will be local elections, I think it's in, uh, in, uh, in September. Uh, because such an, an event can be also a part of the campaign, of the local campaign, and demonstrate that the Greens work together across the borders. I think it's very important to, to show that we are this global picture, this big green family and galaxy. It's for the reason that we decide to organize this event so in Oslo. Some words also about what we call now the green wave, and we hope that the green wave will come, or maybe it's, it's there also in, uh, in Norway. Uh, this year was, uh, we say in French, uh, Grand Cru for the wine, but it can be also a Grand Cru for the Greens, because in several local and national elections in several countries, or also in the recent European elections, last month, we speak about a real green wave. But today, there is a wave, but then after the wave, 
there is a challenge. And the challenges are enormous because the citizens expect concrete results and a real transition from us. And if we come here to Oslo, and I want to thank, thank all the EGP team who prepared this event as we come out a major European campaign, and Mar Garcia, General Secretary, is there and know it, it was not easy to prepare all this uh, event just in parallel with the European campaign. We come here also because we hope the Green Wave will also be a Norwegian Green Wave in September. <laughs> we have prepared a program that I hope will excite you with experts, with green mayors, with vice mayors all over Europe, with technical and political presentations, but also with debates. We are also very impatient to discover Oslo's green initiative while the city is the European green city this year. And so I finish and I wish you a very good conference and also don't forget to take the opportunity of this moment for some individual meetings because it's also important for green elected representatives to get to know each other, to exchange good practices and mutually reinforce each other together. I now give the floor to our Norwegian colleague, Harald Ermstadt. I hope I pronounce because without the book I know the difficulty, uh, who is the current Oslo vice mayor and spokesperson for the Norwegian Green Party. Harald, it's, I give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Evelyn, dear green friends, uh, welcome to Oslo, uh, to the European Green Capital of 2019. It makes me proud to be part of this movement, the green movement. Together we are strong and together we can change our cities, our communities and the world. This spring we have seen the largest climate demonstration as long as I have been living. A year ago, I met Greta Thunberg in Sweden at the, green, uh, the Swedish Green Party uh, on their Congress. Uh, she had just won this um, uh, writer's contest. And I met her parents, and they were trying to figure out, and she were trying to find out, hmm, how do I take this engagement for climate to the next level? Well, we all know what happened with uh, how she, she did that. And we all know that millions of young people across the world had demanded climate action, inspired by Greta Thunberg. And here in Oslo, more than 20,000 youngsters and kids, they were gathered in front of the parliament in March. Uh, here in Norway, they had three demands. It was one, to stop oil drilling. You know, Norway drills a lot of oil. Uh, the other one was to cut Norwegian emission by 60 percent by 2030 and the third was a strong commitment to climate finance. Our prime, prime minister from the Conservative Party, she met the demonstrators with the standard talking points that she has adopted from the oil lobby. That Norway needs the money from this industry. That Norway oil is cleaner than oil from other countries. We all know this is bullshit. And from, but from Oslo to Barcelona, from London to Helsinki, we see that these excuses are not working anymore. And this spring, the EU Parliament has become greener than ever before. So congratulations to all of us. In a recent poll... Yes. <laughs> and you also know in a recent poll from Germany, or recent polls, actually. We are the biggest, the Green Party is the biggest party in Germany. Not bad. <laughs> and we also know that more and more cities across the continent are governed by the Greens. Something is really happening. And here in Norway, we have been in power since 2015. And in that year, we campaigned for cleaner air, 
for safer and better bicycle infrastructure, the car-free city, and real climate ambitions. We wanted Oslo not only to be a good city to live in, but also a green lighthouse, which demonstrates how real climate politics can look like. In these elections, we were the winners. With, 80, with eight, not 80, but eight percent of the vote, uh, we went from one to five seats in the city parliament. But the good thing was that we were the kingmakers, so we could choose the coalition that we could uh, govern with and how to maximize green policies. And four years later, I think I am not the only one in Oslo who are amazed by the results. In 2017, two years ago, it was the first year that there were more people in Oslo traveling to work by public transport instead of their private cars. And car traffic is reduced. There are 14,000 fewer cars every day passing through the toll ring of Oslo. That's good. And also public transport is better than ever before. We have 4,000 more weekly buses, trams and metros. From 2015 to 2017, we have cut emissions by 17, 16, 16, 17 percent. And we're not going to stop by that, because 11 years from now, in 2030, we shall deliver a 95 percent reduction from 1990 levels. That means that Oslo is practically becoming a zero-emitting city. And we're not going to buy any offset to, uh, to accomplish this. And the good news is that this is not the Green Party's politics, but this is the whole uh, government of Oslo who is behind this goal. And that was one of the reasons why Oslo was awarded the European Green Capital for 2019. The Commission is the EU Commission is they think that other cities should learn from Oslo. So what is the Oslo recipe? The first thing you have to do is to set a target that matters, an ambitious target. And the Green Party, we always argue that the climate cha challenge must be solved here, now and by us, and not somewhere else, not later, or nor by somebody else. 11 years from now, that's not many years, so we don't have a lot of time. But the good news is that this aim is fully in line with the one and a half degree ambition of the Paris Agreement. And of course, this target should be adopted by most cities, I would say. Uh, the number two is that we have to, when you are going to do this in 11 years, we're not going to talk about 30% less CO2. What we're talking about is to make everything emission-free. We have to do that quickly. And that's another debate. When you say that we're going to cut, cut all the emissions, then we, if you see a truck on the street, you know that, well, this truck has to disappear, or we have to change, uh, take away the fossil fuel, electrify the truck. So that makes the debate a bit different. When you say that everything must be electrified, or at least emission-free. Our aim is that it should always be easier and cheaper to choose zero-emitting mode of transport. So what we do, the municipality is Norway's second biggest procurer, so all the procurement we do has climate, strict climate requirements. That means that the business who wants to do business with us, they have to change, they have to do something else. So we have ambitious, um, you, we, are having, we are going through an EV uh, revolution on private cars, but we have to export that to vans, trucks, buses, ships and everything else in the transport sector. And we have ambitious and concrete plans to slash emissions also from construction sites, which is a big emitter as well. And that means that in Oslo you can see diggers and trucks powered by electricity. That will be the new norm. And also hydrogen. The third thing you have to do is to make sure that your citizens are feeling safe to walk and to cycle. 
we're not, we're not there yet, but we are moving in that direction. And we have to make sure that people have access to public transport. Oslo is now considered to have the best public transport system in Europe and among the top three in the world. And that, the, that is the result. We see that people are choosing this as preferred. And the really important thing is also that you should curb traffic. And our aim in 2030 is to curb traffic by one third from today's level. And that makes everything easier for the climate aims, but also it makes the city a better place to be. Number four is to capture the carbon from incinerating residual waste. Oslo has almost, it's about 20% of the emissions in Oslo come from one plant where we burn all the waste of Oslo. We cannot get to zero emissions in 2030 without doing something about it. So we have to make CCS as a must-do solution here in Oslo. And we have to make sure that also the CO2 is transported and then put it into uh, aquifers or in, 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 in the North Sea. This is a big project, but we have to do it. We cannot do it alone. We need the government, the national government, to help us. They are a bit slow, uh, but it's very important. And there are more than 450 energy incinerations from, us, from waste to energy incineration plants in Europe, 450. We have to take care of all the CO2 that comes from there. So we think that implementing CCS should potentially be a game changer for Europe's industry. And that's also the cement sector and other industry sectors. We, have no, we don't think that CCS from a gas plant or a coal plant is a good idea because it will be too costly and we have better solutions. But for the industry and for the waste management and for the cement industry, we actually need this. And I hope also that the Green Party in Europe will join us in that fight in order to make that happen. And here in Norway, we will go forward. We, we want to be ahead of the game and be a front runner to make this happen. The fifth thing you have to do is to make a climate budget. We did that in 2017, uh, and that's a tool where we count CO2 in the same way as we count money. So that means if you want to cut CO2, that is the same as to save money, you have to say who is going to do it, when are they going to do it, and how much money or how much CO2 are they going to save. And actually, it's not by my department in the municipality, but it's in the ministry or in the uh, department for finance. Because these people, they know how to count and measure and to control other people. So that makes uh, this instrument much stronger, as we know that, the, of course, we are very powerful when I am uh, the vice mayor for environment and transport, but I know that the finance vice mayor, he is even more powerful. So that, that's an important thing to do. Number six, what you have to do is to support, you have to mobilize support from the people and the business sector. And today I met with five businesses in Oslo. Uh, one of them who is uh, delivering um, concrete to all places in Oslo. And I was, it was so amazing to hear what they were going to do about their emissions. They were actually going to curb most of their emissions in Oslo by 2030 and they deliver a product which we don't actually think of as very uh, CO2 friendly. Concrete is have a problem, but the, this business, this company was so eager to be a part of the move in Oslo in order to make sure that we can together make actually uh, accomplished our own, our own aim of 95% cut. And we have to get out and talk to business sector and make, it, make sure that they can still make money, but still make sure that they don't emit any CO2 in 2030. And that is possible. That's the good news. At the moment, we have more than 100 companies who is part of this business uh, partnership here in Oslo. You know, in September, we are up for re-election. 
And for the moment, the polls in Oslo are very promising. Uh, we set an aim of 15% some months ago, and at that time we were around 10, 9 or 10. And nowadays we are between 14 and 16, 17 on the polls. That's wonderful. So we have, maybe we have to push the aim a bit up uh, later on. But of course, um, polls are polls and uh, we don't live from polls, so we have to make sure that we actually accomplish our aim. And uh, that's why we are well into this campaign. We are knocking doors, we are talking to people. We have been knocking at 10,000 doors so far. And we have uh, met 3,000 voters. And we still have two and a half months of campaigning left. And this, we are doing this because we know that you guys in Europe are doing the same thing. This is the way we are going to win uh, the voters one by one. And we have to tell them that we, the green way of doing politics is the only responsible way of doing politics in our time. So I really look forward to learning about your experiences and discuss how we together can make sure that the green way is flowing all over Europe and not least also here in Norway. So thank you for the attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ariel. It's very enthusiastic and I don't doubt that this green wave will be certainly here in uh, September and about the campaign uh, tomorrow there is also a, a <clears throat> A working group speaking about how to do campaign. Also, I'm sure that our Norwegian friends will participate. And now we have, may I now introduce someone that one month ago he was mayor. When he, we invited him, he was mayor. <laughs> he was mayor of the city of Sheffield in England. And uh, you know, I met him in Brussels because we invited him for an event, but then I've been to Wikipedia to know who is this, this man. And I can say that maybe he's 10 persons in one man, uh, because the youngest he will be, if I'm not wrong, 30 next week. Uh, first Green Party councillor to hold the role of mayor in 2018 in uh, Great Britain. And uh, nobody was thinking one month ago, but maybe he was thinking about it, that one month later he will be elected as a European MEP. Uh, he was elected as local councillor in 2016, and when I say he is 10 persons in one, you must know that uh, he studied aquatic zoology, but interested in music. He produced also his own mixtape on CCD. He made some uh, marathon. He made uh, alpinism. I don't know if it's true, but it's written in Wikipedia and uh, that he's, he has a nickname at the University Martial Arts Club is Magic Magic the Submission Magician. He will explain that maybe. Uh, and he was also elected as president of two Students' Union and joined the Green Party in 2014. It's in 2018 that he was nominated for the role of Lord Mayor of Sheffield. And now as European MEP, he is determined to offer an alternative to the politics of fear and to fight against all the populists. I want to present you Majid Majid. Hello, sorry, my throat's just a bit dry. Well, thank you so much for that uh, very uh, extensive uh, introduction, but really, really appreciate it. For those of you who have not had the pleasure of meeting before, my name is Majid Majid. And for those of you who I have met before, my name is still Majid Majid. But um, you know, honestly, this is my first time in Oslo, and I'm really, really excited to be here. I know I've not been here much, but one thing I really noticed was, was as soon as I actually arrived within the first 
couple of hours, somebody offered me a free ice cream, and I don't know if that's the custom of the people from Norway, but I am very welcome to that anyway, so thank you so much for having me. But it really is a great pleasure to be here today, especially to be with so many other amazing activists and Green Party members all across Europe who are doing absolutely amazing things. And honestly, for me, it's, I guess it's, when inspiration, decent people coming together and working together, that the seeds of change actually begin to sprout within all of us and especially within our society. This conference is an example of such a moment where we network and develop unbreakable bonds, share ideas and from one another actually give each other strength, spread that courage and lead with compassion. It's events like these where we actually realize something important. What we realize is that our identity actually exists beyond artificial borders, ethnic differences, language and cultural lines. We are not north, south, east or west. The hurdles that we face are all the same and the reality that's in front of us is also the same. Yes, we are all European, but more significantly we are all human beings. It is through appreciating the universality of humanity, embracing and shared purpose and recognizing our responsibility to each other, to the future generations and the planet that we call home, that we can truly build a world that we can all be proud of. With everything that's happening at the moment within our home nations and across Europe, spe spe specifically across Europe, we must recognize the threat of the far right within our midst. They are those who have actually been there, who have been emboldened by people like Donald Trump. And of course, you've got your Salvini, Le Pen, and we've got our own Nigel Farage in the UK. But they are there basically just to divide our communities, spread hate and intolerance, and scapegoat migrant, uh, migrants and those vulnerable people. They represent the interests of a, of a few people who are basically people who are basically wanting to greedy basically the polluting multinational corporations and the tax dodging elites and will do and say anything that really serves their interests regardless of the human and ecological cost. When it comes to social equality and climate action, in the face of the urgent need to act, there are those who have dithered and wavered for too long. They've repeatedly chosen surface solutions instead of opting for necessary and holistic approach. Even when the science has been there for decades and decades, we find ourselves today fighting for the same thing. The reality is that across Europe, centrist parties have offered nothing but short-sighted policies, damning future generations to a broken planet, denying us green investment to dramatically improve our lives and ultimately opening the doors to the far right and seductive fantasies. And the working class for white Europe and the UK and our countries have long been neglected by governments current and past who have been obsessed with simply tinkering around the edges and pressing through with austerity. We are at world record levels of social inequality and the top 1% have continued to expand their immense wealth at the continued expense of the majority. That's where I believe that our bold, powerful green vision comes into place. That's why our message is resonate with so many people and I genuinely believe we had the green wave, not just all across the UK, but all across Europe. Because not only are we prepared to call out hate on those who spread fear, but we have consistently presented an alternative vision of evidence-based policy to build a future of equality and dignity for all. What I'm basically talking about is a Europe-wide transformative Green New Deal. The Green Deal offers a clear path towards decarbonisation, reversing biodiversity loss, constructing millions of new carbon neutral homes, transforming industry, agriculture and our energy sectors to be judged against values of well-being, equality and sustainability rather than greedy profit targets and reckless overproduction. It would empower our communities along the way, investing in areas that have been ignored by central governments, enabling and empowering citizens to direct and prioritize these investments and addressing the obscene regional inequalities within all our countries. In short, the Green New Deal works for both people and planet and it can really be implemented, but it really takes the political will to actually make that happen. Compassion must be at the heart and center of everything that we do. Yes, we are living through polarizing times, difficult times. 
where we may encounter events, words, and people that actually infuriate us. But we need to be strong, to be understanding, to work collaboratively, but most importantly of all, show compassion, as compassion is the ultimate manifestation of strength. And I truly believe that if it wasn't compassion that brought all of us into politics, or actually drove us into politics, and in, into one to actually representing people, then we're all in the wrong line of work. The values that embody by a progressive vision and radical politics are the very much part of our every individual human being. We must be people who are willing to embody and practice the change that we want to see in the world. And it really isn't about our individual stories that matter, it's our collective story. The green story that does in our, uh, that does in our fight for a better world. Change for the better is not only possible, but it is probable. When we come together as a movement for the sake of common prosperity, with conviction in our beliefs and committed action, with unity, strength and compassion, we can and we will build that world. And I just want to give a massive thank you to everybody uh, who have actually met so far today, especially to Seth, who's not been here today, who's actually shown me around Oslo earlier on, and hopefully I look forward to meeting the rest of you guys as well. So thank you so much for having me today. Cheers. Thank you very much, Majid, and I'm, I hope, I'm sure that you will bring this kind of message in the European Parliament, and I'm sure that a real Europe with solidarity uh, can also be built with local councillors, with, with people coming from uh, bottom up and from the, from the cities. So even if it's only for six months, but we hope, or maybe more, do it. So now it's the second part uh, of the third part, we don't know, of this evening. Uh, and we will begin now the plenary session with three speakers about the cities of the future. Uh, so these three people, how can I say, they are activists, they are experts, maybe the two together. And uh, on our team, uh, cities for the future, but also what kind of future we want for us, but certainly for our children and for the next generation. And so it's clear that climate change is the challenge of our time and requires not only vision, and ambition, but also actions and certainly political decisions. And you certainly heard about the big march of young people for climate all over Europe. We have seen certainly in Brussels every Thursday. You know what? Yesterday in Brussels, because they have examination, well, it was the march of the grandparents. Wonderful, isn't it? Now we have to see how this march will affect the politicians and their attitude. I know I want to invite a young activist, Penelope Lee. She is there. <laughs> and uh, Penelope is, you know, some of you probably coming from Oslo, you know her because she is a central figure in the climate strike campaign in Norway and she is an environmental activist since she was 18 years old. Eight years old. Eight. <laughs> it was so incredible, eight, that I said 18. <laughs> but you are not 18. Uh, and last year she became the youngest ever recipient of the National Volunteerism Prize. So welcome, Penelope. Thank you. <laughs> As far as we can imagine, as far can we go? Vesna Jusup wrote in an email asking me to come here and share my dream city with you. It made me smile. When I read it, it made me happy. As far as we can imagine, as far can we go? I took those words with me the next, next few days, and as I did, I realized that my dream is not extravagant. It is not futuristic. It is not even special. It isn't huge or new in any way. My dream is very simple. 
my dream is peaceful. So this goes for my dream city as well. I will try to explain. At eight, I start working all I could with environmental issues. I've been working with it almost half of my life now. I did it then, and I do it now because I love life, and I love to live. And I understood that everything I love is in danger. The bees, the birds, the ocean, the mountains, the insects, the icebergs, the cities, the peace. And I want to fight for those things I love. I want to fight for all the things that cannot fight for themselves. So to me, the fight for climate justice is a fight for love. A fight for everything that makes it beautiful to live. Everything that makes it possible to live beautifully. The main force and motivation in dreaming and imagining my dream city planning and building it, will therefore be love. As far as we can imagine, as far can we go? I would like to make my own sentence. As strong as we can love, as peaceful can we be? Sometimes when I get scared or tired, I read about others, people's dreams. People that have dreamed big and made huge changes in the world. It comforts me to read both about the dreams that have come true in many ways, but also those dreams that are still not reality and maybe never will be fully. Like John Lennon's dream in his song Imagine. Today I want to lean towards Lennon's song when I imagine my dream city. No hell below us, he sings in the first verse. To me, this means two things. My dream city will need to exist in such a way that it does not hurt anyone else, anywhere else in the world. And it means that my dream city will have to plan for the hurt we already have caused. It will be warmer in the future. We will have lost even more species. I want to pour all my love into planning for every flower, every insect, every bird, every animal, every human we still have the possibility to take care of. Therefore, my dream city will not be built on top of nature, but around, coexisting, with a deep knowledge that we depend on nature more than nature depends on us. I would start out learning about the land to find out who lives there already, who have lived there before. Animals, flowers, what are their needs and movements? Are there bits of untouched nature still there? Where are the bigots biggest trees, the smallest lakes, the smallest rivers. I would plan the city to take care of those habitats as well as humans. Therefore, I would need to know as much about them as I need to know about humans' needs. Above us only sky, Lennon wrote. Only sky, in my imagination, is clean air rain and snow and sun, wind that does not break us. Only sky is an atmosphere without too much greenhouse gases. My dream city we would be one that can contribute to this. Maybe build on top of a shared transport system, one that does not pollute the air. Only sky, he wrote, and I think about the air we breathe, the air we share. Imagine no possession, Lennon's song. I imagine my dream city 
as a city we share. No large houses just for a couple of humans, but more or less equal places for everybody. As a city where there are shops that can help you take care of your belongings, repair them, and when you don't need them anymore, someone else is getting, getting them. I imagine a city that is not built on the need of constant growth, where people, and especially young people, feel less stress, feel more valued for who they are, because status is not measured by how much you own, but who you are, what you are able to take care of. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do, Ben said. My dream is a city that knows that despite of its nationality, it has no boundaries. Everything important we share with the rest of the world. Wind and rain, sun and peace. You may say I'm a dreamer, Lenin said. But I'm not the only one, I want to say. A dream we share is a strong dream. I know now that I share my dream of a sustainable future with many millions of humans, millions of young people all over the world. I know now that if our dreams is to come true, even more people need to dream the same, need to fight for the same. I hope someday you will join us, Len said. And I beg for more people to do it today. Thanks. Thank you, Penelope. It's very difficult to speak after that. <laughs> and for the two other speakers, good luck. Because it's emotion, of course, but it's more than emotion, and I hope that your dream, you say to us politicians that we have responsibility and we have to act. We, we are listening to that and we have to act. Okay, now, Gunita Kulikowska will make her presentation. It's completely another kind of presentation, but I said to you, this evening is very rich of different uh, speech. So Gunita is founder and CEO of Vividly App. She is coming from Latvia. Vividly is an enterprise whose objective is to facilitate urban planning and architecture workflow with immersive and experiential tools such as virtual reality web digital solutions. And she will present how technologies and communication tools can encourage citizens' participation in building more sustainable cities. Guneta, welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm very pleased to be here, uh, super happy to share um, some thoughts. Uh, I want to remind you that these are just some hints of my experience, my thinking, uh, my work, um, and a feeling about the cities and a passion about the cities, that uh, cities and urban scapes that I have developed. And I've been quite often asked on uh, how does a girl um, studying architecture turns into the technology and uh, and working with these like um, virtual reality headsets and stuff and I'll tell you a short story about that and I think most of us will share that story. Whom of you have been building a tree houses when you were kids? Right? For me building a tree house wasn't just like you know putting a uh, log to log together it wasn't just a construction of a of a space it was rather of building an experience so for me it was super important and where does the house are placed what are the views that i overlook what are the functions that i can like sort of a pathways where's the garden where's the river and so on and so forth and uh 
when I went to the study architecture, it turned out to be not really what I was expecting, I'd say. Uh, and uh, most of the times, I was facing uh, a, a communication issues. When, when I was first, you know, kind of uh, into the contact with the community and showing my super nice visualizations, uh, very ph photoshopped images, and like, hey guys, this is going to be your, uh, your new area. I really saw confusion in their eyes and like, what are you trying to explain us? Like, we really don't really align. And all these tools of drawings, models, and so on and so forth uh, that architects and professionals use are sort of not really the language you would speak with a, uh, with a community, with a pe regular people. So I started to uh, play uh, much more with the hands-on methodology and, and really like being a part of with, the, with building together with the people, um, building a participation while doing, creating the spaces, temporary use spaces in order to experiment. Some of those spaces uh, were entirely neglected and within like a few months they turned into the, to the third place of the for the people of the neighborhood. From being a place for uh, homeless people to just hang out and, and leave their, uh, um, uh, their rubbish, homeless people themselves become ambassadors of, of the uh, place. It was one of the first, it was actually the first participatory planning project in Riga. And uh, thanks to the cultural capital in 2014, um, we were able to make it happen. And that's one of the learnings when you think about the hands-on processes and participation. You need so many like sides and departments and people and skills to come together. So, in fact, if we would like to do something like that now, we would need like confirmation from around 14 different people and institutions. And uh, as a young architect, as a fan of urban sports, as a practitioner of a martial arts, and a lover of a freedom of a movement as such, um, my natural like a need of how to use the city was why a movement, why a uh, motion as such, and I understood that that's the common trait of the all young people. But then I started to discuss with the, with the colleagues and, and uh, also with the, with the politicians of where actually we leave the youngsters. Where are the teenagers in the city? How do we really care about our young urban generations? The generation that's grown in the city, that's raised in the city and will be the future taxpayers and, and economical prosperity and, and will actually the set the, uh, our well-being right? We leave the teenagers and the youth somewhere in the corners, in the, in the very like a locked, secured, gated spaces, skate parks, and so on and so forth. We don't really think of how we could embrace this motion, this youth, youthification, as I called it, uh, in the space. And I started to work with, uh, with uh, again, the placemaking projects, and we turned one uh, very sort of a left space in old town Riga, into the skate park uh, over uh, two nights, I think, right? And we're made, we were able to create, uh, turn this space, which the street actually was called a noisy street, but no one, that was like the quietest street in the, uh, in the whole town. And eventually we turned that into the very buzzy, dynamic, vibrating space for the uh, youngsters. We were able to bring uh, Jan Nesario, the landscape architect, and, and a skateboarder, element uh, skateboarder, as well as uh, Ian Borden, the like, founder of the uh, basically skateboard and the city uh, theory, and to skate over. All of that for me um, sort of sums up into the a recent uh, a post that I found on one of the project report, reports. So that the image of the place is created from all of those three layers, right? The mental, the social, and then the physical. So it can't be just one, it can't be just the hardware. It has to be both hardware and the software. And in fact, to me, this is what I call extended reality, and this is what the technology that I'm working with. It's not another 
like a hardware or a rig or a tool that I work with. I work with the space, I work with the atmosphere, I work with an experience. And using XR means putting one in the center of an experience. And therefore, that is such a powerful medium that we can involve and engage citizens, inhabitants, neighborhoods, different groups. But what we often forget about is that we are able to actually take that experience and, and transfer, like in here. I could bring uh, just a 360 uh, rig and virtually teleport you in, uh, uh, I don't know, Helsinki, uh, Pasila region, um, and uh, we could discuss what would, be the, what would be the circumstances, how we could adapt to this place, how we could change it, you know? And I can bring it to the schools, to the, uh, to the entrepreneurs, to the startup hubs, and so on and so forth. So I don't have to bring them into the space, and we don't have to walk through it and, and discuss. I can, myself, as a professional, uh, I can put myself into the shoes of the other people, like people with fewer opportunities, kids, old people, so on and so forth. Can you imagine how it is to see the space as a kid? I kind of don't. Can you imagine how it is to use the space when you're in a wheelchair? It's hard to imagine. And, and we cannot request from our professionals to know everything and to design everything for everyone. Let's just use the technology that we have in order to, yeah, put ourselves into those shoes, simulate without actually, you know, kind of uh, a long uh, efforts or, or uh, lots of resources. We can put one in directly into the action, like in this Pasila region, uh, between the Pasila basically and Kalasutuma. Uh, it's a, a street uh, in the middle of uh, Helsinki. Uh, people were able via VR to place the crossroads and signs and improve the wayfinding from one region to another. For the planners, in order to be, you know, better understand what are the people's like a pass and a heat map, where do they move, where do they see, right? This allowed to, to involve uh, 10 times more people than it would in the workshop or like kind of this um, invitation open event. To me, it's not a technology after technology. It's the way and it's our opportunity basically in how we can lift the planning culture. And all of the technologies, not just in XR, have to serve for this reason. <sighs> When that's not the technology, it's a process. It's an inte integrity of the workflow that we have to apply. And if we don't think in, uh, with that, about that in the short term, we can really aim for a long term. So if we look at the technology as a part of the process, as improving, redesigning how we plan, how we involve, how we engage, we are really able to uh, to build the long-term vision instead of just a short-term goals. And um, it's very important, and I want to remind again and again, that the right way and how we ask the questions of when we use the technology or what are the circumstances within which is that we address a why do we do it at all. VR is not an answer for all the questions. Uh, none of the technologies is. How do we do it? What are the users? What are the community members? Are they entrepreneurs? Are they young people? This is what affects on what kind of technology we use. The question of technology is the last one. It's not that we're going to be novel, innovative, we're going to use now the 3D and VR and everyone's going to say we are a progressive city. No, it's not going to work like that. It's, it's a short-term uh, win, but it's not a long-term vision. And the thing is that technology does not develop alone and there's no like a one, one pile that is kind of raising and developing, right? There are many of them and we, all, we have to consider all of those, when we, when, especially when we think about the participation. Uh, nowadays, our means of communication is a messaging. It's, it's not, we barely pick up a phone, at least I do, I don't know if we share that in this audience. But we are able to chat, to just send a message, to book an appointment, do that instantly uh, on demand. 
Why don't we use that in the same way with uh, communicating with the citizens? Why don't we just post it and say, hey, just leave, leave the feedback, give us our opinion, give like thumbs up, thumbs down. We are able to iterate with that. 5G networks from a sense that the bandwidth within which we can transfer the data and receive the data uh, is growing, it's widening. It means that all the web-based, online-based participatory methodologies and technologies can be applied in a much wider context. City is developing and city is sensing and uh, we just hear that in, in, the, in the presentations before. Uh, electrical power, uh, driverless cars, it all affects the things and they all have a date and we have to combine that in order to visualize and simulate the different kind of scenarios and, and analytics and, and metrics. And to me, that's how it all combines in so-called uh, 3D model but in the same time, it's a city digital twin. And then from there, you are able to export the visions and scenarios in whole different platforms whenever you need. Because probably you need to involve the citizens, you use a web, but for being able to analyze a different proposals, architectural proposals, you use the virtual reality. But you don't have to produce it over and over again for each of the, uh, each of the device or each of the purpose. You have the one base from where you start. Uh, and this is probably how it looks, the layer of the, after the layer. Um, and um, it opens up many other possibilities also for new businesses and innovations. Uh, probably some of you are able to, uh, you know about the Helsinki 3D city model, so three people basically working in the municipality just around the 3D model, and their uh, marvelous scheme on how many new uh, like fields are opened for, uh, for discovery. For example, the one very, uh, very essential one, being able to analyze the insulation, uh, this case in, uh, in um, stadium, but also on the rooftops, means that all across the city we're able to see what are the most heated rooftops and maybe we can co-finance uh, the solar panels especially on these rooftops. So if we have this data, we're able to play around with it in many different angles. Or we can analyze the densities, we can um, predict, uh, we can play out the scenarios. If we are living in this world that is called on-demand um, and open data and real-time, there are many new questions that arose. And I know that a lot of us are still um, considering what are the advantages and disadvantages, and this is really good what we are doing. But I want to remind again that technology is not a plaster, it's, it's not going to fix anything, we shouldn't look at it as a fixing the process. How I would like to look at it is how with this all power that we have and this understanding and knowledge and build up, how we can lift that planning culture into another level, how we can change the way we actually define what the urban planning is. Thank you very much. <laughs>
and will also underline the question of citizen participation on this question. Nicola, it's your turn. Thank you very much for inviting me uh, to speak in this, in this event. I some, every now and then I happen to give lectures on, on, on this topic, but I want to um, underline one thing that was on the program, and it is I'm here as a, as a change maker, which is interesting. I don't know if I'm really a change maker, but I really would like to be a change maker. But most of all, I'm not here as, as, as an expert, actually. I'm here to try to, sh to share with you some reflections I came um, uh, I came across in my work in Brussels on air pollution and citizen science, and I hope, I hope it will trigger some nice uh, conversation. Second thing I want to say before, before starting with my presentation is that, of course, uh, speaking in front of so many people, uh, doing a good job, good work around Europe, uh, I, I feel nervous, of course, after so many inspiring talks by, by, by the people who, who just spoke. Uh, so, yeah, you just bear with me, uh, be pi patient. And, and then, then we go through, if, if I bubble a little bit, you just, just you know, have some patience and we go on. So first, uh, first um, yep. my first slide is, is uh, maybe rather unusual for, for an event, for a presentation on, on uh, uh, green cities. Uh, and then I want, what does this uh, picture or what uh, does this drawing tell us? There is, there is a boat, a, a ship, and, but, but what's most interesting is there are two rocks and this, uh, this, this sheep, uh, in, my, in my metaphor, is, is, is the city with all its uh, governing or governance system to deal with uh, environmental problems, environmental issues. And these two big rocks, uh, they're, they're on the way, and the sheep needs to find a way to, to go through, not too close to one, not too close to the other one, but, uh, but find, find a, a, a good middle point. And this, uh, two, the, these two rocks, uh, I, I, I named them technocracy and populism. What are technocracy and populism? Uh, well, populism, I think, is rather like um, it's maybe easier to to, uh, to like it's, 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 a, it's a concept which is which you might be more familiar with. Uh, is is a place is an approach to, to to politics or to government where it's not only about offering easy solution to complex problem, but it's also about to say ah the the sovereignty lies with the people, and this is. A very seducing message, and this is, 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 is right to a certain extent, but like this exaltation of the people hides all the complexity of the people. If, if um, the people, if I act on the name of the people, well, I act on only on, 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 on the name of part of the people, not everybody. And so, yes, it is important to work, like to, to, to promote a democratic system, but when we say, ah, the people, ah, wait a second, who, who are we talking about? The second, the second. Yes? It's my beard that interferes. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I'm really sorry. No worries. Okay. Even more nervous now? No, no, no. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> okay. So the second one is, uh, the second rock that is on the way is technocracy. And what is technocracy? Technocracy is also like populism. Uh, offers a seducing message that there should be a mermaid maybe on, on the rock. And the seducing message of techno technocracy is that you give the government of the city to, to experts, to people who know their job and they, they take the right choice in the, in, in the name of the, of the correct policy solution for something. The problem though is that uh, th there's not things like a, such a thing as a good solution. Every solution is good for somebody and not good for somebody else. Every solution, every policy we bring forward is extremely political and will benefit somebody and not benefit somebody else. What, what the <coughs> magic magic was say before is that ah, people will love you, but people will hate you as well. Why? Because indeed, politics is about conflict, is about mediating conflict, of course, but of course th there's no the best solution and, and technocracy will, 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 will trick you if they tell you there is one good solution. Still, bo both populism and technocracy, they, they, yeah, they, they also offer like, um, 
this seducing message. And so after this introduction, and, and so wait a second, going to, to the topic of my speech is air quality. And air quality, I think, it's, is a typical example where you find technocracy and, and populism. These are two slides. This is a screenshot fr of, my, of my screen uh, last year, 2017, sorry. And you have on one side the like, private app telling you the level of pollution and tricking the citizen and saying, not tricking the citizen, sorry, giving to the citizen a very worrying uh, answer to how polluted is the air. And at the same time, same day, same data, same, same place, ah, the, the, the government is telling you, no, no worries, everything is fine. And both of them are tricking the citizen because they try to simplify, they oversimplify a very complex solution. And, and on one side, you have no, no worries, like the, the, the experts tell you, no, there's nothing to worry about. And then you, you should smile. And then on the other side, the, 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 is, a, is a commercial side that wants you to click every, like, uh, often, and so they, they want you to go back and see if the, the situation is always so bad. They also tell you something that, yeah, it's very problematic because they, they, they mix different averages and thresholds limits. So I'm going to try to find a way to deal with this complexity. And how do you do that? Well, yeah, a, a change maker should give you a solution to avoid populism and, and technocracy. I'm not going to give you like a, like a complete solution, but I'm going to talk about citizen science as a small little man in f like on the top of the, of, the, of the sheep that tries to cut through the fog and try to give you some, yeah, some, some advice how to avoid one and the other. So what is citizen science? Well, citizen science is many things. It, uh, m some of you might, might, might know it already. Some of you might know the concept of urban living labs, action research, or similar. These are all approaches that bring together scientific investigation, so the analysis of reality, really. You, like, you look scientifically into, into reality and you try to understand what's going on. Action and experimentation, meaning that, yes, in, it's good to have science, but it has to be for, for, for a purpose, and you need to experiment and look back, okay, my experiment worked or didn't work. And the third and most important point, maybe, of citizen science projects is the collaboration between citizens or the civil society and and, and research. But then in this collaboration, you can bring together business, you can bring together uh, local government, you can bring together many different actors. But the idea is to bring together people with different perspectives. Um, so, citizen science and air pollution, there are, there are tons of different possibilities to, 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 to have a citizen science project on air pollution. They're very um, high-tech solution on, on, on measuring uh, on measuring uh, air pollution, sorry, this is this Braille thing is, is like a uh, couple of hundred euros ma monitoring device that gives you the, the, the map that you see on, on the right. You have this is like a flow, is, is, a com is, a, is a commercial enterprise. This one, of course, is not citizen science, it's not citizen because it's a pigeon, and it's, I'd, I'd be surprised if that was science, but I, I decided to put it there because otherwise people think that scientists are nerds unable to have fun. Um, so this is another, another, some other pictures about citizen science projects. I know of these are in Belgium because these are this is where I work on. One is, and they're all like um, different projects that like you, you can you can measure air pollution really with 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 using like uh, strawberry leaves and then measuring how much black carbon was deposited on the leaves, or you can use this 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 small plastic pipes that will be then analyzed by the by, by, by a label. I didn't put the picture here because I only discovered that very, like, uh, very late, but here in Oslo, in uh, May, or sorry, April and May this year, uh, there was a campaign using white paper and, and Vaseline uh, in schools, and so people would, would make white paper and Vaseline and hang it in, into the, uh, a tree or, or the wall of the school, and a month later see how black that would, would be. And the people working on it is, is NILU, which is a, a research institute uh, based in Oslo, and, and there are two, two researchers here. You, you can meet later if you, if you want. And so to say that there are many different ways to measure air pollution and to engage citizens in measuring air pollution. Um, what, what do these this, this things measure? Well, it's a bit uh, a technical thing. Well, air pollution is a very long, it's a very long process from, from emission, so fr from the source to, to, to <laughs> health impact, a very bad health impact indeed. And this, this project, they only focus on concentration and exposure, so which are only to, to show you like citizen science is good, but of course it's not like there are things you can't yet use, like you can't yet measure. We're still working on, on developing tools to measure the other things, but, but of course uh, science is, is an adventure, like you, you never have the truth, you, you always like develop. 
uh, other ways to, to do citizen science or to do collaboration. This is what, what Evelyn was talking about, is this Brussels Air General Assembly. For those who speak French, it was the Etat Généraux de l'Air, which sounds much cooler because the Etat Généraux was the General Assembly before the French Revolution, and since it didn't work out, then they did the revolution. So this is a bit the, the purpose of this kind of things. Uh, and the idea was, to, within three days, to bring together scientists, hackers, we did a hackathon, we brought together children, they, 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 blo they blocked the streets, we had the, the critical mass, we had architects designing on this side, they, they're, they're designing um, a, a, how a street, a school street should look like. And so this was a way to, and then we had politicians debating in the evening and coming, it was just a, week of a, a month before the elections, and we were telling them, look, this is what the scientist says, this is what the citizen says, what are you going to promise us? Um, and I hope, secretly hope, that, that, that it would uh, pu push some votes on, on the good side. And it seems now in, in, in Brussels, to, uh, like the, the, the green wave seem, seem, to, seem to, to have taken place. Um, another, another ah, what is air pollution? What is citizen science and air pollution? Yesterday, interesting enough, was the, was the um, uh, European Clean Air Day, uh, and then organized. By, like, by a citizen science a European citizen science organization across Europe. So it's interesting how citizen science were the one bringing about, bringing the topic on, in, into the public event, and they, they, they're the one really like pushing it. And one of the leaders of this, of this, um, of this day is indeed Nilu, so based here in Oslo. So I'm, I'm very happy we're here uh, today. So here another slide a bit more technical about different ways to do citizen science. Citizen science is many things I was telling you. It's not only about using different technologies, but it's also about involving citizens in different ways. Either you crowdsource, and this means that citizens are just carrying around a device, but as a scientist you have the research questions and, 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 and the analysis and everything, or at the extreme level, they call it extreme citizen science, I like the way they call it, um, where, where scientists and, and, and uh, citizens or scientists they were really together on defining the problem, on posing the questions, to make sure that the questions are not just questions posed within a scientific perspective, but are of the interest of, of, uh, of uh, uh, citizens, of, of uh, communities, of, of activist group. I, I have a role in the Council of Europe as the rapporteur on smart cities for the Congress of Local and Regional Government Governance Committee. So I'm really interested in linking the two talks because you've talked about the potential of the technology and now you've talked about the role of citizens in terms of citizen sensing and living labs. So my question is that um, I've suggested our report on smart cities has to be framed around inclusion but it also has to be framed around who controls the technology and who designs the technology because the technology isn't neutral, it's shaped by what the users write into it or what the developers write into it. So I would suggest there's an extra question in terms of the city, the role of the city, which is to challenge who, whose technology and not be experimented on by the companies developing the technology, but be led by citizens defining what their problems are and how they want the technology to solve their own problems. And that makes it truly inclusive because then it's uh, a smart city for citizens, mm -hmm. not on citizens. So should there be a challenge? Should there be something about control? And that would bring the democracy and the inclusion into the, the smart cities and the citizen-led uh, science. Thank you. That's a big debate on our <laughs> So about the inclusive city, city for the people. Do you, and, want, uh, do you have a reaction? The counter question. Does any of the cities have a CTO? Chief technical officer kind of role yet? I think it's a question of uh, re redesigning the organization as such. I mean, that has already existed, and in the private sector you can see that, and any industry, any company is under the same pressure. Why would cities be in a, in a different role? It's just cities have to take a, take a courage and uh, really implement this office that deals with the data, security, uh, technology, and, and so on and so forth, and knows all the departments you know, uh, across, the, across the municipality. 
And early on, as I mean now, everyone, like every city, should really think about making a deal of where this data comes from, who owns who owns it, or where does uh, you know kind of the limits are. Uh, I don't know a case of where the city would uh, be, you know, making um, um, that sort of a deal with the bigger or smaller players. Yeah. Nikola, you have something? Yes. No. Regarding this smart, I'm personally a bit. I don't really like the term smart cities. That's mm -hmm. why in, it, actually the name of my project was funded through, it was called Smarter City. Because indeed, the term smart always hides, oh, a smart city, like you have a smartphone inside. Because even if you don't want, the, 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 way, the way the language works and it shapes our way of understanding, smart city is, always goes through digital technology, which are problematic for the, for the, for the issues you have raised. We, we need to, 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 I think we need to have cities being on top of this kind of things, meaning that it's not, oh, let's the technology company come and, and they solve the problem. That's not going to happen. Cities need to be in, in control, first thing. Second thing is, uh, f regarding like usage, uh, there is, I think, about old people, for instance, as, as people who typically be, are left as outside of this smart technology discussion just because they don't understand it. And so here, people say, oh, oh, let them understand and let them learn smart technologies. Or in my topic was also, let them learn pollution and so on. Actually, I think it's the other way around, is that scientists mm -hmm. or technology people need to learn the language of these people and try to, to, to come with solutions like vis-a-vis exactly, vis -vis yeah. their people. That's, and it sounds like, oh, of course, of course. But it's very complex. It's, it's very, very complex. And we need, we need really to... Uh, to work on that. It's really about an approach. This is what I would like. Put yourself into the shoes of a user. User in the center, not technology, not the municipality, but the user. Then you will find an answer. Okay. Uh, tomorrow there is a working shop with the Green European Foundation tomorrow afternoon about smart city because Green European Foundation made also I don't know if it's a research or a work on this question of uh, smart cities. And now uh, it's also the big question of the lab cities and the, the difference between smart cities and lab cities. But that's another debate maybe for another event. So I've seen three more interventions. Uh, of course, we can discuss after also uh, here. I come back. In the there front. is a microphone there. Ah, sorry, you and then you and I see Kelly there and uh, okay and there our Hungarian friend. I think so, yeah. <laughs> Zoltan. <laughs> okay. Hello, my name is uh, Anders. Um, I work with Natur.no. Um, Where are you coming from? Uh, Norway. Yeah. Not, uh, I work with Natur.no. Um, but I'm been very interested in seeing where the whole world is going right now and all of the solutions. So I'm gathering thousands of videos and, and thousands of, of websites and everyone. But um, mostly I'm, I'm interested in how do we actually work with the companies that are doing the change and the people and the government together. And I, I think your tools and the presentations you had were very nice to figure out ways to do that. Uh, but those are the tools, the actual platform where it happens and, and how we're connected is kind of missing because I'm hoping to see more permaculture and all of the different like vertical uh, landscapes, the food cities, the, um, the vertical um, production of food. Uh, all of these things are coming into line and um, how do we actually work with the companies and the government together? Because it's kind of behind closed doors and it's not really uh, open for everyone to come and discuss yet. And that's why I, I'm hoping to see these solutions come up with the apps where it's an open discussion. What are we doing to make that happen? That's my question. Okay, maybe we take two interventions and after we come back here. Thank you very much, um, Kunita and Nicola, for your talk. My name is Magdalena Davis. I'm from the Czech Republic. And I have a specific question for both of you, um, whether you have any 
experience with working with organisations such as schools or other um, groups of people. And I'm asking specifically because in my town I've actually tried to work with um, parents and the school in particular where parents were uh, complaining about the quality of air inside schools, like in inside the classroom. And so we have offered the school to have a pilot project of um, CO2 um, chips, like monitors, in the school so they could uh, monitor and then later we could decide what to do about it. And um, this is actually quite strange to share this with you, but I found out after a while that they um, installed these um, control chips into some rooms where there were no kids and eventually they pulled them out and put them in a drawer and uh, shut them in because the, um, the num numbers were so high that they were worried that something's bad going to happen, that the school's going to get shut down or whatever. Um, and I, I'm really curious whether this is the sort of post-communist thinking in the Czech Republic, which probably in Latvia might be slightly similar, and that's why I'm interested in your feedback, and whether there's still this kind of divide between the West and East, where in the East people, instead of trying to push for change, they retract and they're scared about the consequences. Thank you. Okay. Not too long, because it's... Large yeah, debate, if you have something, okay. and, and then we take the two last questions. Okay. So I'll, I'll give a feedback on your questions, and then you give the, <laughs> to the uh, lady here in front. So how do uh, we work, like how do co co companies work together with the... I, I'll, you, you raise many different issues, but the one I, I, I would like to give an answer to is the one, uh, how do big companies, like how do cities work with big companies indeed, because the, there is this, this issue. I think that this goes back to the reflection I was starting before. I think what's important, two things. First of all is uh, be transparent about the politics of technology. There's, there's, what I mean is uh, technology is never neutral, so the, very important is to say this technology will benefit these people, I will not benefit this. It's extremely unpopular to say, but, but you need to be transparent about that. That's, that's crucial, because this will, this will yeah, this will, is, is, is the only way to foster democracy. And the second one, uh, I, it, it escaped me now, but, uh, ah, yeah, yeah, second one, very important. People say, I, I think about, for instance, the electric car autonomous, if you hear politicians speak, or not only politicians, but the like car developers as well, ah, they say, ah, in the future, the car will be, um, autonomous will be electric, will be shared. Fine, all this is fine, but what I don't like, and what I, my answer is about the verb, will be. There is this, uh, this, uh, ah, this fatalism about that, that is the anti-politics. Nothing will happen. We will make it happen. And I think whatever you want to work with, with, you want to work with Google, fine, you work with Google, it's fine, but it's not because it's unavoidable, it's not because, ah, yeah, yeah, no, the future, we, everybody will work with Google. No, 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 it's a, it's a political choice because we like multinational corporations or because they have a good service for all of our citizens, but, but it's very important to be voluntaristic and not fatalist about, about how the future will happen. The future will not just happen. We, we, we are there to, to make it happen. <laughs> you need that, that's my, uh, sorry, I'm a bit like uh, uh, I'm not Italian sure she's way. convinced. Uh, but <laughs> uh, building uh, on the transparency aspect, the best way to um, cope with the fear is to really face the fear. So again, in the communication of uh, crowdsourcing, involvement, engagement, you have to, to admit that what's going to happen, what's not going to happen. You have to say, hey, I'm as a planner, I don't know all the answers. Can you guys help me? Can we do this, do this together? Uh, I, as a politician, I cannot be the one to, to decide, like, shall we uh, decide upon that? Can we make this unique use case and, and measure that and improve the school and be it as a role model? I think that, again, the communication gap um, and the, literally the focus on on this like responsibility of the of the politicians instead of uh, collaboration is what really uh, lacks at the moment in uh, in planning culture again <laughs> or engagement culture thank you zoltan and kelly yes 
Thank you. Oh, sorry. Hi. Uh, my name is Otan, and I come from a country which makes the headlines pretty frequently. Uh, I come from a city that also makes, um, with its government, the headlines um, very frequently. Um, the country is called Hungary, and the city is called Budapest. Um, I always... Um, I always feel privileged to be with you, and listening to you uh, convinces me um, always that um, it is not a coincidence that the Greens uh, can be and should be congratulated, especially in the field of urban and city governance, especially this year, especially in this age, which if it goes into history books, which it surely will, will have, um, you know, will be described as the age of um, illiberalism, post-truth, fake news, populism, stupidity, uh, and decadence. So, um, as a, my, my professional background, one of my professional backgrounds is teaching, teaching history. And as a comment, I would be um, very happy to, to share with you uh, or to just to, to call your attention to the importance of learning. To be smart, to be smart in a city or to be smart in an urban community cannot be taken for granted. Um, the um, societies and the individuals are forgetting basic things all too easily and all too quickly. So. The notions of democracy, freedom, autonomy, um, justice, human rights, um, and city has to be retaught and rethought and redefined right now in all over Europe, and also the notion of Europe. Um, what we can do, and what, as, as a small example, do in Hungary, in Budapest, under these circumstances of a stupid and and um, tyrannic um, kind of di dictatorial um, uh, political regime is that we try to collect um, schools at local levels and introduce um, educational training to teachers on democratic citizenship, European citizenship, entrepreneurial skills, um, and active learning. And if we consider uh, the notion of smart cities as learning organizations, as knowledge-based organizations, knowledge-based societies, then I think my recommendation would be um, just that um, the EGP and the community of these excellent um, green cities should make um, a focus on education training uh, at city level and I would be very happy to see EGP, Jeff, and all the Green parties, not just in Eastern Europe, but also in all over Europe, to come up with project proposals and go for educational funding from the European Commission. Thank um, you. You can finish, please. That, that, that's all I wanted to say, and I'm really privileged to, to be Thank with you, you. Thank uh, you later on as well. Thank you. It's more a message for EGP than for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Kelly? Thank you, Evelyn. My name is Kelly Yen. I'm the convener of the Global Greens. And my question is actually for Penelope, but also to all of us here, including the panelists. Um, what are some inspiring success stories of working with all generations to join us in driving the transition to a sustainable city, country, nation, world, region? I'd love to hear your, um, your tips, your good ideas, your recommendations, and your you know, success stories. And I know we're short on time, so maybe we don't talk about it right now, but let's talk about it tonight over dinner and for the rest of this conference. So thank you for sharing with us about your experiences, cross-generational transition and activism. Thanks. Thank you, Kelly. That's a good conclusion because tomorrow, 
there is time in working groups and I can invite you to come tomorrow because it will be also very interesting and there we can have also more, uh, more debate also about the initiative that some of you are taking in your, uh, in, your, in your city. So thank you very much, but I ask you three minutes, three minutes because we have someone who will come to present a short video. He said me it's one minute. And uh, it's uh, Ville Elonaimo from Joanse in Finland. And uh, you know, Finland, it's the city, uh, the, the Finland, it's the, the country where we had also a big green wave. And we have now three ministers. One is Minister of Environment and Climate, and uh, it's Krista Mikkonen. She's not here, but she's coming from uh, the city of Ville, who is Johansson. Mm -hmm. He is also local councillor and member of the Urban Planning Committee, and he will present you, but certainly invite you to a winter cycling conference in Johansson. Johansson, yeah. <laughs> That's how it's written. Uh, yes, first of all, our uh, Minister of Environment and Climate, who will next half a year lead the EU delegation in climate negotiations, I, is, I realized just a few minutes ago, is a local councillor or colleague of mine. Krista mm -hmm. has made a huge 20 years as a local politician and that's why she's there no but let's see first the video and i have an invitation for you In Joensu, in Joensu, in whole year, one of the three tips daily in the city to school, work, uh, shop, and back home is made by bike. And uh, there is a tribe of uh, winter cyclists, winter bikers in Joensu. I'm one of them and uh, Krista Mikkonen is also one of them. It's cool to be winter cyclist. So, <laughs> welcome to Global Winter Cycling Conference next February, I suppose second weekend of the February. Joensu, Finland. It's far away for us. St. Petersburg is not an eastern city, it's a uh, southern city. But we are still in the EU. <laughs> thank, thank, you, thank you very much. So Finland, uh, we make our next uh, council in Finland in November in Tempere. 
And I'm sure that we will come back in February in mm -hmm. your answer. <laughs> I'm sure of that. So thank you very much, and we see you tomorrow morning, and thank you to our speakers. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs>